This is Chapter 3, The U.S. Legal System and Alternative Dispute Resolution, Part 2, presented by Kelly Herzig. Now that we've talked about the state court structure in Part 1, we will discuss federal courts and their structure in this part. As a reminder, Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution created the federal judiciary. The federal court system has three main levels. The U.S. District Courts, they are the trial courts. Currently, there are 94 district courts throughout the United States. The next level is the Circuit Courts of Appeals. This is your appeal of right in the federal system. Currently, there are 13 circuit courts, which are the first level of appeal. There are 12 geographic appeals courts, the first circuit through the 11th circuit, plus the District of Columbia circuit, the DC circuit. The 13th circuit court is the federal circuit court, which hears appeals from specialized courts like trade. Geographic courts, the first through the 11th, contain various numbers of states. The states are divided up between the districts to try to make it roughly even given the amount of volume and the amount of population. For example, Kansas is in the 10th circuit, but our neighboring Missouri is in the 8th circuit. There's also something called the BAPs. These are the bankruptcy appellate panels, and they're specialty courts to hear bankruptcy appeals only. Bankruptcy is rather complicated. It's a huge statute, and so some of the circuits have elected to create these bankruptcy appellate panels separate and apart from all the other civil and criminal trial appeals that they might hear. These have three judges, and they're established as three judge panels by the circuit courts, and they hear these bankruptcy appeals, and they're established in the first, the sixth, the eighth, the ninth, and tenth circuits. The final level of appeals in the federal system is the Supreme Court of the United States. There are nine justices on the Supreme Court, and the fifth edition pictures them correctly. If you bought the fourth edition, it still has a picture of Justice Kennedy, who retired. He was replaced by Justice Brett Kavanaugh, nominated by President Trump in 2018. The U.S. Court of International Trade is also what they call an Article III court. In addition to Article III courts, the federal court system has several courts created under Article I and Article IV. The federal court system has several Article IV courts, also known as territorial legislative courts, created by Congress. Territorial courts in Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Northern Mariana Islands are all Article IV courts. Puerto Rico, though it is a U.S. territory, has had an Article III federal court since 1966 via federal statute. It is the only U.S. territory with an Article III federal court. Article I legislative courts are created by Congress for a specialty purpose, such as to review agency decisions, military court decisions. They can create ancillary courts with judges appointed by Article III appeals court judges, or they create administrative agencies with administrative law judges. They include bankruptcy courts, the U.S. Tax Court, Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, U.S. Court of Veterans' Appeals, and the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Because we covered Chapter 3 in two parts, we did cover some jurisdictional issues for federal courts in Part 1. But let's do a quick refresher of federal courts and civil jurisdiction issues for federal courts. Federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction, meaning they can only hear cases authorized by the U.S. Constitution or federal statutes. The federal courts have original jurisdiction over cases arising from the Constitution, federal statutes, or treaties. The federal courts also have exclusive subject matter jurisdiction over certain types of cases. You've seen this list before, but we'll repeat it here. Bankruptcy, Admiralty or Maritime Law, Disputes Between States, Cases Involving the Military, Copyright or Patent Law, Constitutionality of a Law, 
and cases involving the laws and treaties of the U.S. and ambassadors and public ministers. Federal courts have pendant jurisdiction over state law claims brought with federal claims. Let me explain what that means. When you have a case that the parties file in the federal court, say under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the plaintiff may also have various state law claims arising from the same transaction, say the sale of that defective car. Rather than force the plaintiff to file their federal claims in federal court and their state law claims in state court, for judicial economy, the federal court, if it has jurisdiction, under federal question jurisdiction, for example, it will scoop up the state law claims under pendant jurisdiction and also hear those state law claims, even if it might not have originally had jurisdiction, because there, there needs to be one outcome, one case for one transaction. You don't want to have two different cases going at the same time, one in federal and one in state court, because you might have different outcomes or results. And for judicial economy's sake, you have one case. And that's how come courts exercise pendant jurisdiction over state law claims and scoop those up. Continuing our refresher, federal court jurisdiction over, often overlaps with that of state courts. This is called concurrent jurisdiction, meaning that claims can be brought in both courts. This is our discussion on diversity and federal question. The plaintiff, the person bringing the claim, can either choose to file the lawsuit in state or federal court. However, if a plaintiff chooses state court, a defendant may have the option to remove a case to federal court under certain circumstances. So what is removal of a case to federal court? Removal of the case simply means transferring the case, even over the plaintiff's objection, from state court to federal court. Basis for removal, diversity jurisdiction. Just like the plaintiff can bring a case originally in federal court if all of the plaintiff and the defendants are diverse and the cause at issue is more than $75,000, so too can a defendant use diversity jurisdiction to remove the case to federal court. Federal question jurisdiction cases can be brought or removed if there's a question of federal law at issue, such as a claim under a federal statute. So just as if the plaintiff can bring their FDCPA claim in federal court, if the plaintiff instead chooses to bring their FDCPA claim in state court, the defendant, if they desire to be in federal court, can remove the case from state court to federal court based on federal question jurisdiction. Basically, it works both ways for plaintiffs and defendants, the same rules. Large class action cases with 100 plus more class members and worth more than $5 million aggregate have special removal rules, but they too can be removed from state court to federal court. Cases can be remanded, sent back, if removal requirements are not met and the decision to remand the case to state court cannot be appealed. Basically, um, you can try to remove a case sometimes and you don't meet the requirements and the plaintiff can object and kick the case back to state court. Now let's talk about criminal jurisdiction in federal courts. Criminal cases have different rules than civil cases. Criminal cases cannot be brought under diversity jurisdiction. States can only bring criminal prosecutions in state courts and the federal government can only bring criminal prosecution in federal courts. Double jeopardy, which prohibits a defendant from being tried twice for the same charge, does not apply between state and federal governments because they're both sovereigns. This means a defendant can face double prosecution for the same act if that act violates both state and federal laws. Now let's talk about judicial selection in federal court. Article III judges, meaning federal district court judges, circuit appellate judges, U.S. international trade judges, and justices of the Supreme Court are lifetime appointments with salary protection. They are nominated by the president with advice and consent of the Senate. Senate approval is now by majority vote for all judicial appointments, including the Supreme Court, meaning that 
any judicial nominee only needs 51 votes in the Senate to be approved. Article one judges are appointed for a term of years and have no salary protection. For example, bankruptcy judgeships are 14 years, appointed by the circuit court in which the court sits and based on federal statute. Magistrate judges, which work with the federal district court judges in discovery, are appointed for eight years full time by a majority of the district court judges. Now that we've talked about the federal court structure, let's talk about the threshold requirements for getting into court in the first place. To hear a case, in addition to all the jurisdictional issues we've talked about, courts require three things, that the plaintiff has standing to bring the case, that there is an actual case or controversy, and that the case is ripe for hearing. Standing simply means that the plaintiff has a legal right to bring the case. They have an actual injury or stake in the outcome, i.e. they have skin in the game. For example, if you're in a car wreck and someone hits you and you are injured, you have the standing to bring a lawsuit concerning that accident and that injury because you were the person injured, you were in the wreck. On the other hand, if you're a bystander and you just happen to see this accident, you couldn't bring a, an accident-based lawsuit on behalf of, say, an injured person because you weren't in the car wreck, you weren't injured, injured. you only saw it. You have no skin in the game. You have no standing. The case or controversy requirement has three elements. That the plaintiff and defendant are adverse to each other, i.e. they're taking different pos positions on a transaction. That there must be an actual legal dispute. They can't have made it up. It can't be a friendly thing to try to get uh, an opinion out of the court that's a basically an advisory opinion. It, it can't be a setup and the court has the ability to resolve the dispute, that it's something that a court can actually render a decision on. Ripeness, which is the third element, means that the case is actually a current dispute and the resolution will affect the parties immediately. The court will not hear cases with only a future claim, i.e. there's not an actual claim now, but there could be one in the future, or where the case is already resolved and done. That's called rendering the case moot and the courts won't hear things that have already been resolved because it's moot. Now that you've got met the threshold requirements and gotten your case into court, let's talk about the general steps in civil litigation. The US has an adversarial court system in that each party presents their case to the fact finder, either the jury or the judge, sitting as the fact finder in a bench trial. There are rules of court procedure and rules of evidence that control trial proceedings. The fact finder, either the jury or the bench trial judge, decide matters of fact. The judge, in his judicial capacity, rules on matters of law. If it's a bench trial, the presiding judge wears two hats, that of judge and that of fact finder meaning the judge decides both matters of fact and law. Federal courts have federal rules that all the federal courts follow. It's the federal rules of civil procedure and it applies to every federal court. Procedures can be different in every state. Each state has their own procedural rules and evidence rules, although they are very similar, but they're not always the same. So civil cases filed in district courts, either state or federal, they all generally do have, though, a pretrial phase, a trial phase, and a post-trial phase. Let's talk about the pretrial matters phase of civil litigation. Once a complaint is filed by a plaintiff, the defendant is served with a summons, the service of process. We've discussed that previously. Once served, the defendant has a set time to respond to the complaint, filing an answer to the complaint. In many states, the defendant has 30 days from the date of service to file an answer with the court, though that does vary state to state. Some states just simply have less than 30 days. Texas is a good example. In federal court, defendants have 21 days to answer the complaint, except that the U.S. government and its agencies have longer. They have 60 days to answer the complaint. Instead of filing an answer, a defendant may file a motion to dismiss the claim for a variety of legal reasons, such as a motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction, 
they may allege that the court has no jurisdiction over them as a defendant, or they may argue that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter of the lawsuit. There's also other types of motion to dismiss, such as failure to state a legal claim. A, a defendant may file a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim if a plaintiff in their complaint hasn't laid out all of the required elements of their claim that they are seeking relief under. The defendant may also file a motion for judgment on the pleadings, meaning that even if all the facts in the complaint are true, the defendant is, is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. That just means that despite everything in the plaintiff's complaint and it's taken as true on its face, that that doesn't rise to a legal claim that they can sue on. Now the plaintiff has a right to file a motion response to these motions dismiss and then the judge rules. If the judge grants the defendant's motion to dismiss, the case is over and is usually dismissed. However, in cases of failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, the judge may give the plaintiff a chance to fix the legal deficiencies in the complaint first. If they haven't stated all the elements to a legal complaint, a lot of times the court will gently point out what's wrong with their complaint and give them a chance to fix it, particularly people who are representing themselves who they call that pro se, because the court doesn't want to kick out pro se plaintiffs on a technicality. If the judge denies a motion to dismiss, then the defendant must file an answer to the complaint. After the answer, the defendant and the plaintiff engage in what is called discovery. Discovery is simply the investigative stage of the lawsuit, and it's where the parties exchange written questions called interrogatories, they request documents, they disclose fact witnesses and experts, and perhaps take depositions of the witnesses. There is usually a long pretrial discovery time period in state courts, and it can also be fairly long in federal court, depending on the complexity of the case. There's usually a pretrial order that governs the discovery process and how long you get. There's a, it's a preliminary statement of the time periods. For example, you have 90 days to do interrogatories. You have 90 days to get your depositions done. Um, sometimes courts don't issue a pretrial order and it just goes on until the parties say it's over, which can be frustrating for defendants who wanna get the case to trial quickly. Depositions are in-person questioning of witnesses under oath and before a court reporter that takes down all the questions and answers verbatim. These depositions can also be done over the phone or by video. It depends on the notice and the agreement of the parties. Sometimes there are discovery disputes over the scope of discovery, though it is generally very broad. If a party objects to producing a document or witness, for example, the requesting party can file a motion to compel that piece of discovery, which is ruled upon by the judge. Now in federal court, that's usually the magistrate judge, not the district court judge, because magistrates usually oversee discovery in federal court. At the conclusion of discovery, the parties will often file what they call a motion for summary judgment. In a motion for summary judgment, the moving party asserts that there are no material facts in dispute and that he, she is entitled to judgment as a matter of law when the judge applies the law to the undisputed facts. The facts are demonstrated by the discovery exchange and the affidavits. In a motion for summary judgment, you make your legal argument as to why you win, but you also have to support it with copies of affidavits, portions of depositions, copies of the interrogatory responses. You have to have your evidence lined out, citing each piece of evidence that supports your legal argument. It's not purely just a legal argument like a motion to dismiss is. Once the motion for summary judgment is filed, the party opposing the motion has the opportunity to respond by showing that there is a genuine dispute as to the material facts. A lot of times there may be 
conflicting witness statements. And that pretty much guarantees that there is a material dispute of fact that only a jury can resolve. Because credibility between two witnesses is not something that the judge is going to decide on summary judgment. That has to be decided by the finder of fact, the jury. But if the judge reviews the motions and the evidence and grants the motion, then judgment is entered for the moving party and there is no trial. The losing party will then have post-trial and appellate rights. If the judge denies the motion in whole or in part, there will be a trial. Sometimes what will happen is you will file a motion for summary judgment, but you'll only win on certain counts. In other words, the judge will say, mm, they don't have a breach of contract claim here, but they do have a fraud claim or they don't have this aspect of an FDCPA claim, but they do have this one. Sometimes it's used to winnow down the claims that will be tried at trial. You can also file what they call a motion for partial summary judgment, meaning that you only address the claims where you really think that there is no material dispute of fact, and those are the claims that you can kick out and force the plaintiff to try only the claims that are truly in dispute. After the summary judgment stage, the parties usually engage in pretrial motions, usually to restrict the evidence admission at trial. They're called motions in limine. They're also usually required to file jointly and a complete pretrial order, which is like a blueprint for the trial and will govern the issues at trial. It lays out all the claims that are gonna be tried, all the legal defenses that are going to be raised, the witnesses generally that will be called, the evidence generally that will be put in. It's a fairly big document and the parties usually have to agree to large portions of it. Sometimes when you just can't agree, you each submit your own section on something and you detail that for the judge. Judges don't like that. They want to push the parties to agree on the pretrial order, but sometimes you just can't. The judge will also have at least one pretrial conference to try to narrow the trial issues and will, will perhaps order the parties to mediate their dispute to try to settle out of court. That's alternative dispute resolution. We're going to talk about that coming up shortly. But it's my experience that judges don't want to have a trial because it's expensive. It takes up people's time because they have to sit on the jury for a week and they usually get paid eight or ten dollars a day. And so like, if they're paid by the hour, they're missing work. Judges don't want to have a trial just because they take up so much time and energy. So they try to push the parties towards settlement. I don't know how many times I've gone to the final pretrial conference thinking I'm going to get my trial date and the judge says, well, I'm not going to give you your trial date today. I want the parties to mediate by so-and-so date. And so instead of getting your trial date, you go back to mediation. Now let's talk about trials. Trials are very formal and generally have these stages. Jury selection, that's where you get to question the jurors about their fitness to serve on the jury to see if they have any innate prejudices that would prevent them from rendering a fair and impartial verdict. In state court, a lot of state courts allow the lawyers to ask questions of the jurors, but in federal court, you have to submit questions and the judge does it. After jury selection and the jury is seated, the attorneys make their opening statements. It's the roadmap of the trial. It tells the jurors what they're going to prove and how they're going to prove it. Then there's presentation of the evidence and witnesses. The plaintiff has the burden of proof in civil trials, usually by a preponderance of the evidence, and so they get to present their evidence and witnesses first. Once the plaintiff presents their evidence and the witnesses are cross-examined by the defense if they so choose, then the defendant can decide to file what they call a motion for directed verdict following the plaintiff's case in chief. It basically says the plaintiff didn't meet their burden of proof and didn't prove their case, so judge, you need to dismiss it. It's a very hard motion to win, particularly mid-trial. Um, and usually you do that motion solely to preserve error and to preserve your ability to file certain post-trial motions. <laughs> 
after the plaintiff's case in chief and the plaintiff rests, then the defense gets to put on their evidence, if they so choose, and the plaintiffs get to cross-examine the defense witnesses. The defense then rests, and then the plaintiff does usually, if the judge allows it, have some rebuttal witnesses or evidence to the defense's case. Once the evidence is all presented and the case is closed, then there's closing arguments by the attorneys. This is the sum up. This says, hey, I won my case. Here's why. Remember, this witness said this. This witness said that. Did you see this document? That all shows that I make my claim and that I win. That's basically what closing arguments are. Once closing arguments are done, the jury is dismissed and there's a jury instruction conference between the attorneys and the judge. That's where the attorneys present the proposed jury instructions to the court. Usually there's form jury instructions. Kansas, we have something called the PIK, the pattern instructions for Kansas. And you have to select jury instructions out of the pattern instructions and say, judge, I need to present this, 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 and this instructions to support my case. The defendant says, I need these instructions to support my defense. And you go back and forth until you come up with a jury instruction that the judge will then agree on. Then the jury is called back and the judge presents the jury instructions to the jury. Usually he just reads the jury instructions straight off the page to the jury. Once the instructions are given, the jury, is, the jury retires and deliberates. If they can come up with a judgment, they'll come back and they'll announce the judgment of the court. Sometimes before there is a judgment or an announcement of verdict, there's questions. And the attorneys and the judge have a hearing to decide how to answer that question. Then the judge calls the jurors back in, reads the question, and gives the answer. And then the jury goes back out and continues their deliberations. Sometimes they can't render a verdict and they get hung up and they call that a hung jury. Um, that means that they just can't render a verdict. And so the judge has to render a mistrial. That's relatively rare in civil cases, although it does happen. It's more common in criminal cases when the, they just feel the state just can't prove their case. There may be one or two holdouts. Um, it happens more often in criminal cases and civil cases. But once the jury decides on a verdict, then they come in and they announce the, the verdict and the court enters judgment. After that, then there is post-trial motions after the judgment is entered. Now let's talk about post-trial motion and appeals. After the jury verdict is announced and entered, sometimes parties will file post-trial motions to alter or amend the verdict announced by the jury. Usually it's the losing party, the person who is not happy with the jury's verdict. The losing party can file a motion for a new trial claiming one, that there are substantial trial errors, that the jury's decision was clearly erroneous, that there is substantial new evidence or substantial misconduct like jury tampering. In criminal cases, you'll also see motions for a new trial based on prosecutorial misconduct. Um, sometimes prosecutors will withhold what they call exculpatory evidence, which if they had been given to the defense would have cleared the defendant of wrongdoing or provided a substantial defense to the defendant. Parties can also file a motion for judgment as a matter of law, claiming there's insufficient evidence to support the jury's verdict as a matter of law, also known in some state courts as a motion for judgment notwithstanding the verdict. This motion basically says to the court, judge, the party who won really didn't win. They didn't really meet their burden. The jury got caught up in the emotion of the trial, but as a matter of law, I win and you should grant my motion. There's also motions for remittiture. These are motions to reduce the jury's monetary award, usually punitive damages, and they're fairly common. There's an entire line of Supreme Court cases about the ratio between 
actual damages and punitive damages and what is supportable on appeal with respect to the punitive damage award. For example, if you have $50,000 of actual damages, say that's the value of the defective car in a lawsuit that you win, you're not going to be able to keep an award of $2 million for punitive damages because it's disproportionate to your actual damages. But if you got, say, $200,000 in punitive damages awarded on your $50,000 actual damages, you could probably hang on to that because the case law basically says that a one to four ratio of punitive damages to actual damages is legally supportable on appeal. Now, either party may file an appeal on the judge's decision on post-trial motions or the final judgment entered. Any alleged error must be a prejudicial error of law. A mistake that is so significant, it is likely that it affected the case's outcome. Now let's talk about the appeals process. If you really don't like what happened at the trial level, either with the judgment or the post-trial motions, you can appeal. A party has a time limit to file the notice of appeal in the trial court, usually 30 days from the date final judgment is entered. The case generally has to be docketed with the next level appellate court, usually the State Court of Appeals, and you have to file a docketing statement. In Kansas, you have 60 days to docket the case once the notice of appeal is filed in the district court. This first appeal is sometimes referred to as a party's appeal of right. In the federal system, appeals from the district court go to one of the Federal Circuit Appeals Courts. The district court will transmit the record on appeal to the appellate court, which generally includes all of the pleadings, all the pretrial and post-trial motions, all the court orders, the final jury trials transcript, evidence entered at the trial, the jury instructions and verdict, and the judgment. Basically, all the key pieces of the trial below go up to the appellate level. Once the record is transmitted and certified, the parties will file their appellate briefs. An appellate brief is essentially a written argument with citations to the law and the trial record as to why you should get relief on appeal. Basically why the other side is wrong and that there was a substantial error in the trial court such that you deserve appeal relief. Now let's continue to talk about the appeals process. The appeals court will review the record from below and decide the case is a matter of law. They review cases of law de novo, meaning from the beginning, they are not bound by the holdings of the trial court as to the law. They are bound by the findings of fact. They don't hold a trial and they do not make factual findings. The judicial panel is usually three judges most often. After review of the appeal, the the appeals court will enter its decision. The court will issue its decision, one, without a written opinion on the case, usually published in a table. It's called in a table opinion. Two, in a summary decision in writing called a per curing opinion, it's usually one or two pages. Or three, which is the most desired, in a formal written opinion laying out the appeals court's ruling and reasoning. The shorter versions, the table opinion or a per curiam opinion, usually occur, occur when the court finds no error at the trial court level and affirms the lower court. They don't take the time to write a big long opinion unless it's of substantial legal interest to the community. The appeals court can affirm and accept the lower court's ruling and decision. They can modify the lower court's ruling or decision, particularly the remedy granted. They can reverse the lower court rulings if it finds that the lower court was in error, or they can remand the case to the lower court for further findings of fact or even a new trial. So they can affirm, modify, reverse, or remand. Those are your four appellate options. Well, what are your options if you lose your appeal, if you don't get a favorable ruling out of the intermediary court of appeals? If you're unhappy with the decision of the Court of Appeals, a party can seek out and seek to appeal to the next level appeals court if the state has both an intermediate and high court, if they have a Court of Appeals and a state Supreme Court. 
In state courts, this is often the state Supreme Court, like the Kansas State Supreme Court. But there are, of course, other names for the highest appeals court in various states, which we've discussed previously. In the federal systems, appeals from the circuit courts go to the U.S. Supreme Court, the highest court and court of last resort. Now, you don't get an automatic appeal to most state courts. In fact, I don't know anywhere you get an automatic appeal to the state court if there is an intermediate appellate court. Or the U.S. Supreme Court does not automatically take appeals either. You have to file what they call a writ of certiorari to seek an appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court and usually most state Supreme Courts. The writ of certiorari is basically a request to the court to hear the case, laying out why is it a, it's a significant enough case for the high court to take it. The U.S. Supreme Court takes only about 80 to 90 cases a year, which is a very tiny fraction of the cases that seek review there. Sometimes, if your appeal is taken up by the state Supreme Court and they rule that, for example, the statute upon which the original case was filed is unconstitutional on both the state Supreme Court and the U.S. Constitution, you can appeal from your state court, Supreme Court, to the United States Supreme Court. It's very rare, but you can do it in certain narrow circumstances. I want to switch gears now and talk about alternate dispute resolution. Lawsuits are time consuming, expensive, and stressful for both plaintiffs and defendants. If you recall when I was telling you about going to the pretrial conference, most judges will order you into some form of mediation prior to getting a trial date. They want you to go and settle out of court. And that's what mediation basically is. It's resolving your case outside the legal system on your own or with help from a mediator. On average, 97% of civil lawsuits settle prior to trial, mostly because it's so expensive. It can cost upwards of $100,000 easy to get a case to trial in federal court these days. As I was telling you, trial judges and trial courts often mandate some form of ADR prior to setting a trial date, most often mediation. There are many benefits to settling lawsuits through alternative dispute methods, which is basically settling it outside of court. It's generally cheaper to settle a case through ADR than to take it to trial due to increasing legal fees and trial costs. As opposed to spending $100,000 to get a case through trial, you may only spend a few thousand dollars on the mediator's fee and your lawyer's fees for a day or two in mediation. It also saves time on average, it takes over two years to get a case to trial, sometimes even longer than that in state court. It also avoids uncertainty in the potential for an adverse precedent being set. Remember we talk about precedent being the basis of a current decision based on a prior decision. Well, if you get a bad precedent, a bad ruling on how to interpret a statute that goes against your business and people file that claim over and over again, they're gonna cite to this case that you lost over and over again. So if you settle it outside of court, you have no adverse precedent to bug you in future cases. The parties also have more control in the case and they can avoid third party jurors with no expertise in the area from deciding the case. They can basically control their own destiny, decide how they wanna settle the case and on what basis, as opposed to putting it in the hands of 12 jurors who know nothing about you, your case, and a lot of times know nothing about the subject matter of the lawsuit. If they do use alternate dispute resolutions, the proceedings are confidential. Usually there's very, very narrow exceptions on when you can bring what happens at an ADR into court. But most of the time, what happens at mediation stays at mediation. It's just kind of like Vegas. The proceedings are facilitated by a mediator or an arbiter with experience in the area of the dispute. If I'm, for example, mediating a consumer case, I'm going to find a lawyer who knows something about consumer law. Alternative dispute resolution is generally less adverse and businesses can iron out disputes while potentially saving a business relationship with the other party. Sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. It just kind of depends. If it's business to business, usually ADR is less adverse. 
people can kind of put aside their disputes if they want to mediate a contract that they have and then move on down the road, particularly if they've got a government contract where they have to work together. Um, ADR works really well and it's less adverse. If it's a consumer against a business, usually that adversity carries over from the trial to the mediation and you don't see that much difference in the adverse nature of the parties. Now let's talk about the different ADR methods. The first one is just negotiation. It's generally informal, it's done with or without lawyers, and is usually done voluntarily very early in the case or even before it's filed to resolve a case without much legal cost. Sometimes someone will send what they call a demand letter, which is a pre-suit letter to the opposing party saying, I've got this claim, and if you don't want to, if you don't want to go into a lawsuit, you need to settle with me now. Well, usually when we get that letter, we can negotiate with the other party and try to settle it before they file a suit or shortly after they filed the lawsuit. That usually happens when you have claims that aren't worth a huge amount of money. Then they're, they're usually anything under $25,000 anymore. We can a lot of times settle with negotiations pretty early on. Then there's the most popular ADR form, which is mediation. Mediation is a more formal process than negotiation and is usually facilitated by a neutral mediator selected by the parties. It can be voluntary, like we can have a very early mediation to try to save the core cost before we even do discovery to see if we can resolve it at the front end. If negotiations don't work and we think we need a mediator to help us, sometimes we can have a voluntary mediation at the beginning of the case. Sometimes you get ordered there by the judge and you have a mediation conducted under court order. I've been ordered by mediation to a judge a record six times in one case um, because he didn't want to try the case and he kept sending us back to mediation. It's the most times I've ever been in mediation in one case by court order, but usually it's once or twice and then the judge will give up. That case, the judge kept sending us to mediation. Now the, the mediator doesn't have the power to make a decision that binds the parties, okay? But he does, or he, sh or he or she does frequently give his or her opinion on the case, the value of the case, how good the plaintiff's case is, how good the defenses are, to try to move the parties to a settlement, to try to move the parties to the middle as much as possible and reach a settlement. I often say that the best settlements are when nobody's happy. When the plaintiff has given what they think is too much and the defendant has paid what they think is too much, usually that's a pretty good settlement. Now mediation is confidential and generally statements at mediation cannot be used to trial. There's a moratorium. There's an actual uh, evidentiary and trial rule about the inability to use mediation statements at trial. Now, if the parties reach a settlement and sign a settlement agreement, it's like a, it's a binding contract and the case is done. You report the fact that you've settled the case to the judge. The judge may or may not want to remove, review your settlement and then the case is dismissed with prejudice and it's over. Now let's talk about another alternate dispute method, arbitration. Arbitration is a dispute resolution method that occurs outside the judicial setting. It is probably the most formal of the big three, negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. Most arbitrations are governed by the Federal Arbitration Act, which applies to both federal and state actions if the party's transaction involves interstate commerce in any way. In other words, if the transaction between the parties crosses state lines at all or implicates interstate commerce in any fashion, then the Federal Arbitration Act will apply. If, however, it's truly just within a state, which is rarer, um, the state rules on arbitration will apply. Arbitration is usually a contractual method of dispute resolution i.e. when the parties enter into a contract, they usually have a provision in the agreement that requires the parties to arbitrate rather than file a lawsuit. These arbitration provisions are appearing with increasing regularity in consumer contracts like credit card agreements, car loans, and mortgages. The majority of internet sales also contain arbitration clause in their required terms and conditions. If you want to buy something online, you have to click I accept the terms and conditions. 
chances are if you click that to buy whatever you're buying online and you have a dispute about the product, there's an arbitration clause hidden in the terms and conditions that will bind you. Many consumers have tried to challenge these provisions as unfair, given the lender's relative power as unconscionable, because consumers often win less, and those that do win in, in arbitration often get less money than they would from a jury. There's a view that in consumer cases, arbitration is, is more unfair to the consumer and benefits the company itself rather than the consumer. It's not a level playing field. However, in a series of cases going back to the 1980s, interpreting the Federal Arbitration Act, the U.S. Supreme Court has generally upheld arbitration provisions in consumer contracts, even those provisions which require consumers to arbitrate class claims. There was a study that came out last year, in I think January or February, so it's about a year old, that found that 81 of the top 100 companies require arbitration with their consumers. And 78 of those require them to arbitrate even their class claims. So if you're buying things from Amazon or Walmart online or pretty much any of the bigs, guess what? There's an arbitration provision that will prohibit you from filing a lawsuit. You will have to file an arbitration. Usually, the arbitration provision details the number of arbitrators, whether the American Arbitration Association AAA rules apply, and they usually do, the hearing location, and how costs of the arbitration are to be split. Generally, they require that the filing fee be split between the plaintiff and the defendant. And for consumers, that can be cost prohibitive because they have to come up with several thousand dollars, which is their half of the arbitration fee, to be able to get into arbitration in the first place. So it becomes prohibitively expensive to even bring a claim. Arbitrators are usually lawyers with expertise in the field of the dispute. Most often there is either one arbitrator or a panel of three. It's a streamlined process and there is usually some discovery, but that's based on the AAA rules and the discretion of the arbitrator. The hearing is similar to a trial in that the parties present their case through witnesses and documentary evidence. But unlike a court trial, the rules of evidence on what can be admitted before the jury don't apply. The only thing that really applies are the rules against privileges. In other words, you can't force someone to put forth attorney-client privileged information in an arbitration. The arbitrator is more involved in the hearing and can ask questions of the witnesses, and often does. Um, I've been in arbitrations where I barely get to ask any questions because the arbiter spends the whole time questioning the witness, and by the time it's my turn, the arbiters ask most of the questions that I'm going to ask. There's usually no court reporter or formal record like in a court. Um, basically, the arbiters take notes um, of what the witnesses say, they summarize them, but there's no transcript. The arbitrator's award is binding on the parties and cannot be generally appealed, though there are some limited appeal rights to the district court. Um, it's very limited. Great deference is given to the arbitrator's findings, and basically the only basis for appeal is that the arbiter was corrupt, the obvious, he was obviously partial, engaged in misconduct regarding evidence or scheduling, or exceeded his or her powers. It's a high burden to meet, and it's very difficult to get an arbitration award overturned. There are other less popular alternative dispute resolution methods detailed in your book. There's MedARB, there's a summary jury trial, there's mini trials, early neutral case evaluation, and private trials. These are all very rare ADR methods. I've never done any of them and I've practiced for nearly 30 years. The only things that lawyers generally look to when they're looking at ADR are the big three, early negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. They're the overwhelming methods used by most lawyers. Most of these other types of um, ADR come in very specific types of cases, 
like class actions or specialty cases like um, patent cases. You just don't generally see these as a normal trial lawyer. Well, that include, concludes part two of chapter three.